Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining the afternoon session. So my name is Paco Mendes, and I'll be presenting with Alberto Venturini. And uh, we'll be talking about refactoring massive code bases. And, and, and the problem space is so big that, that it takes two of us to present. So a little bit about us. So we work for SPAN. Uh, our engineering offices are, are based in Cape Town. Um, but our account office is, is based in San Francisco. So all of our clients and the problems we work with uh, are based in, in the Bay Area. As a consulting company, we can obviously not disclose explicit details about all of our clients. Um, but, but what we're presenting today is, uh, you know, a, a lot of real work we have been doing over the past year and some really interesting problems on, on, on highly massive code bases. So we're talking 200 million plus lines, lines of source code. Um, so, so I hope, hope you find this interesting. So the, the key themes we'd like to talk about, so starting off, you know, how can refactoring help us stay successful? Um, then we're going to be talking about some of the challenges of refactoring massive code bases. And then we've got a case study which ties in really nicely to some of the previous talks, especially Josh's on you know, deleting unreferenced code, uh, or unreferenced classes specifically, and, and how something seemingly fairly, fairly simple can, can grow really complex on, on, on a massive, massive code base. And through that, we'll present a data-driven approach um, that, that we use to automate refactoring. And finally, we'll um, just share, share a few um, learnings we've had on, on how to justify refactoring. So refactoring, conceptually, is, is an extremely straightforward topic. And, and, and I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, we all believe in it as, as technologists. And it's, it's how we make changes to the internal structure of software to make it easier to understand and cheaper to modify without changing the observable behavior of a system. So the key goals here are really to try and improve the overall design of our systems. Um, so that's everything from performance, security, um, the abstractions, and, and how we segregate and isolate different parts of our systems. and and. And a, a really important goal following that is the efficiency of our engineers. So we've mentioned that quite a few times at, at this conference, that, that engineers are the scarce resource. The problems we work with are extremely complex. So how do we, how do we make ourselves more efficient as teams? And what I don't like talking about is we don't refactor because I don't like that code. And I think everyone here has probably followed that trap where we dive into a code base and we start changing and moving the chairs around and, and changing something because we don't like it stylistically. It may have been written 15 years ago. But that's not a, that's not a good reason to refactor code. Um, especially on a massive scale, you just cannot dent or, or make a significant dent on a system if, if you take that approach. So I, I like what Josh was speaking about earlier. The, these are the types of problems that you really need to leave to the linters and, and leave to, to your tooling to, to resolve. So large systems, I think, by, by being large, are, are successful. And, and that's because it, you know, it, it takes a lot of time and energy to, to build a large system. But they also need to be able to adapt to change to stay successful. And refactoring is, is, is an essential part of, of any engineering discipline and provides us with the means of our adapting our technology to change. So what does success look like? And, and this is a typical picture of a favela in, in Brazil. And a, a quote I, I quite like from, from one of our engagements was, uh, we're sitting with a client and talking about all his problems, and he sheepishly kind of opened up and, and told us a little bit about everything that's, that's going wrong. And, and towards the end, he, he looked at our CTO and he said, you know, is everyone else this fucked up? Um, to, to which our CTO replied, and he said, only the successful companies. And, and at first, that idea didn't, didn't quite sit well with me. I think as, a, as an engineer, I really believe we can build optimal solutions, and, and, and almost all the engineers I work with, they, they, they really strive to build a, a, a good product. Uh, we, we get immense satisfaction out of building something that, that feels elegant, um, that uses clean patterns. So, so to concede that success is going to be this, this messy, messy place, and we need to accept it, felt, felt a little bit discouraging. But, but it is also 
important to to remember that that you know if if we look at these favelas, it may have started with that big uh, big monolithic block on the left, but but this is actually what success looks like, and, and we see this pattern all over um, on, on massive systems. So how, how do we remain successful? I think this, this is fairly obvious, right? So we've, we've got to first of all build the right thing. So the solutions we build have to be aligned with the right business strategy. Um, and then we need to build it right. So, so we've got to build systems that are both resilient and reliable, and, uh, and, and that should be pretty simple, right? Um, and, and the final key, key point is, is we need to adapt to change. And, and again, this has been repeated many times at this conference. Um, we, we need to be able to respond to internal and external factors to, to, to be able to adapt our architectures. But getting it right is, is extremely difficult. And um, I'm, I'm going to also, Josh, thanks for the airplane. I really stole my thunder there. But, uh, the, the, the MAX 737 program, if, if any of you are aware, um, was extremely successful. So Boeing was able to, to launch uh, aircraft in um, really quick time. Um, they were responding to changes in the market. They were able to introduce a bigger engine onto an older airframe and reuse a lot of their legacy uh, technology to, to get an aircraft built quickly. But so strategically, they did many things well to be successful, but they also didn't build it 100% right, and uh, that resulted in two fatal crashes. And despite having an order book of 5,000 aircraft, they're currently sitting with 400 brand new aircraft on parking lots all over the US waiting delivery. So, so even established old organizations that are large and that do the same thing over and over can still fail. Jumped. Okay, cool. So, so again, this theme has come up a few times already. Um, you know, do we build things fast? Are we in fast mode or building things the right way? And, and there isn't a, a, a perfect answer to this, but, but typically early on in projects, um, it's much easier to build things fast. And, and, and the faster we can go is often a consequence of the technical compromises we make or the amount of technical debt we allow. Um, and, and this is a strategy that, that many companies follow early on. There are a lot of benefits. You get early feedback, quick time to market, uh, all, all those, those kind of good reasons. And you also get to learn technologies without in, over-investing into design. But, but there is a balance. And, and being in, in projects in this phase is amazing. You know, you really kind of sitting in your speedboat, full throttles, you've got all these teams, we, we all kind of working towards the same goal. And, and it's really exciting, except for that DevOps guy at the back who's just getting splashed and having to pick up everyone else's mess. Um, and, and, and I really like this analogy because, you know, early on in projects, we've got clean water, we, we're just going, but, but we often forget about the turbulence we leave behind. So we leave this big wake that just continues to propagate and the, you know, the further we go, the wider that, that cone becomes and, and it becomes very difficult to go back and, and change certain decisions we make in the past. So if we take a much longer term view, and um, this is based on, on the design stamina hypothesis, so I think it's only the sixth Martin Fowler reference uh, in the last two days, but um, all projects struggle to, to continue to grow um, as, as they become mature. Um, for obvious reasons. Running in production, it becomes much harder to change something that's already there, um, and, and we start investing a lot more of our time into maintenance activities. But, but there is an interesting switch where building things fast isn't always the right approach for the long term. And um, often building things right in the long term will result in, in a more effective team. So it's difficult to pick when this transition occurs, and and either strategy can work for different business, um, businesses and, and different systems. But what we need to recognize is the longer, um, the longer we go, the harder it is to, to close that gap. And um, the more technical debt we allow, the harder it is to, you know, this problem amplifies. And, and again, I, I know I'm preaching to, to the converted here, but, 
But these are the, the typical things we need to use to, to justify refactoring effort within organizations. So why is refactoring so, so difficult at scale? I think key point is, again, talented engineers are scarce. So the amount of effective coding activity we can do as a team um, is, is really hard to, um, to scale out. So, so that's, that's one of the key, um, key issues. So there's often a constant focus on delivering value, keeping customers happy, keeping our systems online, making sure you know, the next feature sets are good. So there's often little time to, to address technical debt. Um, teams are often understaffed. We're often trying to maintain two or three different systems at a time. Um, it's, it's hard to you know, have, have a big picture view. There's a mix of skills and experience. So people going through organizations, spending two years making a mess, leaving. It's, it's the nature of, of, of how we work. Um, well, actually, that's rather short tenures. So, um, and, and it takes a lot of effort to, to make engineers productive, especially on massive code bases. So, so code bases that are massive are obviously very complex to change. And, and one of the, the key reasons is we're just dealing with large volumes. So our, our code base itself is, is a data source that we need to really treat like, like a data source. Um, we've got millions of lines of code and, and configuration. So, so as I mentioned earlier, we're dealing with systems of 200 plus million lines of code. If we had to divide that by everyone in this room, it, it would take us years to, to, to refactor pieces of it. Um, there's no accurate model of the system boundaries. Um, so there's, you know, there's a, it, it's very difficult to, to model these systems, so you don't always know what consequences you're gonna have on, on downstream teams of, that, that may be using your services. We're dealing with a mix of new and legacy patterns and technologies, so it's, it's very difficult to move a, this a massive code base in unison. So we have to live with both new and old and, and find ways to strike that balance. Um, we deal with extremely complex dependency graphs, so some services we've, we've kind of looked at 900 plus dependencies where um, you know, those are both second, second party, third party dependencies. So you have this very brittle dependency graph that making a change can have quite significant consequences downstream. And then slow builds and poor test coverage. So um, as, as an example, com compiling in, in the order of 40 minutes to, to compile, um, making changes and experimental changes just doesn't become feasible. So you have to take a very different approach when, when you're dealing with, um, with those types of slow builds. And of course, uh, large systems are typically non-deterministic, very difficult to test and, and recreate uh, um, production scenarios. So, so it's slow and, 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 and difficult to hypothesize a change test that change, and then introduce that change. So, so the whole cycle is extremely slow. And, and of course, there's a high risk of failure, and, and this is what often holds back a lot of refactoring effort is um, organizationally, why would we change something and introduce all this risk if there's no observable uh, change to the functionality? So, so that is one of the challenges that, that we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get to later on, on how, how, we, how we justify refactoring. Um, and then our reliance on open source. So similar to, to a lot of the points Josh made, open source has really allowed us to, to build on the shoulders of giants and, and grow. But, but on massive code bases and the more open source we adopt, um, open source you know, projects end, um, they, they can be quite unpredictable. And uh, they, they allow us to grow really quickly, but then we have to live with the consequences of, of those decisions. And, and that can make it very difficult to to move off certain, certain tech. So we'd, we'd like, Alberta's now gonna present a, a case study and we've purposefully chosen something relatively simple that, that we can all associate with and, and it's a simple problem of, I've got a massive code base and I need to delete all unreferenced classes. Hello. So, Deleting our reference classes. Um, this cannot be a refactoring talk without a mention to the refactoring book by Martin Fowler. And in that book, there is a mention about um, removing code. 
Um, it's actually a brief mention to it, um, and it says if the dead code can be referenced from outside, e.g. when it's a full function, do a search to check for callers, uh, then remove the dead code and test. Now, there are a few assumptions that are being made um, here, and one is that um, there, is there are tests, there is good test coverage, and that's often a pretty strong assumption. Um, the second assumption is that uh, searching um, for uh, unused code for uh, full functions, and as well as searching for callers of that code, of that piece of code, is feasible in a reasonable, reasonable amount of time. And when the code base is really massive, that might not be necessarily the case. And there is a third assumption, which is that um, the code, the unused code, can be uh, found statically. So um, that's sometimes not the case, especially when we consider that many languages or many platforms allow you to uh, use reflection, so to instantiate or call things at runtime without necessarily knowing about these calls um, statically. Um, so removing um, an unreferenced code is really um, an instance of refactoring at a global scope. And what do we mean by that? Um, so at a local scope, uh, we have refactorings that uh, when you apply those refactorings, for example, uh, pulling a method up or renaming something, at a local scope, uh, the number of things that you have to change in your code base as a consequence of applying that refactoring is limited. So it's maybe think of anything that is in a private class or anything that um, is visible within a well-defined boundary, it could be a package. Um, so those are refactorings that are constrained to a subsystem and as such they are easy to execute because the number of things that you need to change are easy to count, easy to identify. On a global scope instead, um, that doesn't hold. So the things that you potentially need to change as a consequence of applying a refactoring um, are potentially across the entire system. So think about deleting a public class or deleting a public method. How do you know beforehand uh, who uses that class? Um, so in, the, in that case, a manual execution is not an option. Um, and uh, what we need really is a different approach. And we uh, think that a data-driven approach to refactoring and to building refactoring tools is the right one in this case. So what do we mean by data-driven refactoring? Um, working with massive code bases, we came up with a sequence of steps that, um, that enabled us to identify and execute these refactorings. And the first step is to, identi to really identify the problem that we are trying to solve. So to be clear and specific about the refactoring that we are trying to solve, and once we identified the problem, we start exploring it. Um, so we uh, start to understand it um, a bit better. What kind of patterns are we looking at? And we start extracting data um, about this problem. And really, these, these steps uh, feed into each other because, for example, the more data you extract, the better you can understand the problem, the better you can further explore it. So it's a kind of an iterative loop already at this stage. Um, once you have extracted enough data about the refactoring problem, you might want to analyze it and present it early on. Um, presenting it early on is actually important because you want to include into, in the loop uh, the domain experts, so the people who know a lot about this legacy code base as soon as possible. And they can tell you if what you're working on is um, actually makes sense, if it's valuable, if it's a valuable effort. How, how often does this problem occur? Is it just a few occurrences throughout the entire system or is it thousands of occurrences? So you, you kind of start getting a sense of the, the, the scale of the problem that you're looking at and whether it actually makes sense working on it. Um, once you're happy that this is a problem worth solving and you've analyzed and presented the data, um, you might want to automate. Um, and uh, here, automation is really two ways. It's about auto automating the data extraction and uh, the creation of these refactorings, as well as the automation of, of executing these refactorings. Although we mostly focus on automating the data extraction, 
uh, because we still want people to own the act, the final act of refactoring. And we want to build tools around uh, uh, making this whole process easy. Um, and lastly, we want to break this down into actionable tasks. And we'll see that this is important because this creates feedback loops within the organization. So we start by identifying the problem. Um, and suppose you have this structure where you have a few libraries. Uh, the language doesn't really matter. In our example, um, we worked on uh, Java code bases, but this could be in other languages. You have a series of libraries, they might depend on each other, and you might have a number of applications uh, that could be services, for example, top-level applications that in turn depend on these libraries. And you have a class in one of the libraries, and uh, you might want to do a few things with this class. You might want to delete it, you might want to move it across, move it up or down, or you might want to rename it. It doesn't really matter. At this stage, you're identifying the problem that you're trying to solve. And you might want to start, you know, it makes sense to start using, to, to, to start exploring the problem using um, existing tools. Um, so off-the-shelf tools, for example, modern IDEs have a way to identify code that is not referenced. And uh, IntelliJ is one of them. So we actually did that. We started off by, uh, uh, running the uh, IntelliJ's unused declarations tool. And on a modern laptop, it actually took hours to complete um, because the, the scale of the code base is so massive. And besides, there is another downside to it, which is uh, this tool doesn't really have any specific knowledge about the, our system. So it doesn't know when um, we might want, we, we might use things by reflection. So, um, or maybe it doesn't know that we should exclude classes, we should never delete some cert certain classes that are annotated in, a, in some way. So it doesn't really have specific knowledge of our, our system. Um, and the further we explore the data, we understand that we are really dealing with complex structures. Um, so this is uh, an example of an actual dependency graph uh, um, between uh, Java artifacts. And what you have is um, hundreds of them. and um, they don't really line up into a neatly structured tree or tree-like uh, you know, hierarchy. Uh, the relationships are very messy and tangled, so you're really dealing with um, um, a degree of complexity, of, of complexity. So, okay, we, earlier on we understood that you know, using existing off-the-shelf tools to execute these classes of refactorings didn't really work for us. So we started off investigating, um, uh, creating custom tools. And in our case, our build tool is Maven, which is a popular build tool for Java systems. And we started creating Maven plugins. So plugins that uh, plug into the, uh, into the build process of our code base and extract information about the code base. Um, think about analyzing the bytecode of your uh, Java artifacts, as well as analyzing the source code of whatever source you have. And with this analysis, we can then answer specific questions about the code base, such as what are the classes that we can delete safely. Um, and this works, sort of. The one disadvantage of this approach is that every time we have a new question or classes of questions that we want to ask about our code base, we are left with coding a new plugin or maybe creating, adding new logic to the existing plugin. So the next step that we took was to decouple the data extraction phase from the data analysis and transformation phase, essentially putting a database in between. And we earlier on, early on uh, settled on using a graph database um, just because code is really uh, easy to express as a graph of elements that are in interconnected with each other. So now our Maven plugin, what it does is it still analyzes the bytecode and source code of our code base as well as configuration files and other resources and creates this graph that we can then query to get information about our code base, to answer specific questions about the code base. And this is actually, um, uh, this allows us to unlock further refactorings, meaning to, to answer new questions that we didn't even think about before. Uh, just because it's very easy to, once you have a database, to run new queries on it, to explore the data. Uh, at this point, we also 
present the results of our refactorings as a list of candidate refactorings. Um, so this is an example. This is actually a subset of our data model, our actual data model that we use to model our Java code base. Um, so we have a few entities, artifacts, classes, uh, methods, fields, and we can see that they are connected uh, with each other and with, uh, with themselves as well. Uh, for example, an artifact can depend on another artifact or can contain a class, and so on. And, uh, for example, considering classes, how can they be connected with each other? Um, so here we have a few classes. Each blue dot is a class, and they reference each other. So where, by reference, we mean that they make use of another class. Or we can see up there a few classes extend other classes. So we really model these connections between our code constructs. Um, and then we use this model to, delete, to, to, to identify the classes that we can delete. Um, so to simplify things, um, suppose you have two classes, A and B, and you want to find classes um, in this very simple system, you, you want to find classes that you are able to remove. So the idea is to find classes that are not used, meaning they don't have incoming connections. So in, in the picture, it would be class A. So you say, OK, we can delete class A. Engineer, you tell engineers that they can delete class A. Once they delete class A, they, you run the analysis again, and you find that now you can delete class B, because now class A is gone, so that reference doesn't exist anymore. Um, and so you've basically, you've had two round trips between you and your engineers um, because first they had to delete the first class and second, and as a consequence of deleting that first class, you can now delete the second class. A further optimization is to um, be able to um, identify groups of classes that can be deleted together. Basically, you want to say, I know that if I delete class A, I will also be able to delete class B. And so you don't do two round trips between you and your engineers. You tell them, hey, you can delete class A and class B at the same time. Um, so how do we do that? We basically keep finding unused classes in our graph database, marking them as deleted, and then repeating the same process over and over until we don't find any more classes that are unused. And once we have completed that process, um, we come up with deletion clusters. Um, so basically groups of classes that they can, they, they can be deleted together. They, it's just a matter of running a graph algorithm that connects the results together, a strongly component, uh, connected component algorithm. And basically what you, see, what you end up having is um, there are a bunch of classes that can be deleted as singletons, uh, so they act of deleting them doesn't really uh, uh, unlock further deletions. Um, whereas other classes, if you delete them, you will in turn unlock or, or enable the, the, the possibility of deleting other classes. Um, so once you have identified the classes to delete and you've presented the data, um, you should really ask the question, should you invest in tooling and uh, in creating tools to, to extract this data automatically? And in our case, the answer is yes. Uh, we've seen that using off-the-shelf existing uh, tools didn't really scale for us, didn't really work for us. Um, there are a series of challenges to using um, existing tools. Like, as I said, they don't scale very well. They don't have specific knowledge of the system. And, they, and we might want to um, un ask specific questions about, about our code base. So we might want to execute specific refactorings that those tools uh, might not even know about. Um, but of, of course, um, this is, these are tools that are lengthy uh, to, to, to create. Uh, so the cost of creating these refactoring tools must be justifiable. Um, so it must be a trade-off between costs and benefits. Um, the last step um, in our process is creating actionable tasks. And this might be overlooked, but it's actually an important one because we believe that engineers 
and you probably, as engineers, uh, can relate to this, uh, you know, we are often in, not, we are not often in refactoring mode. We are, for whatever reason, we are in feature mode, but not in refactoring mode. So we really don't want to make engineers think too much. We want to make th um, tools that are easy and actionable. Um, and we wanted to make it easy to uh, plan, to refactor, and also to track, so to, to kind of have a feedback loop into what refactorings were executed. Um, this is because we want to provide visibility into what, you know, what refactorings were executed. Um, we want people to be able to go back to their managers and say, this is how much I've improved things by executing these refactorings. Uh, so the, these benefits must be measurable, of course. Um, so this could be measured in, uh, with things like, how much have I improved my build time? Or how much have I reduced my um, container image as a, as a consequence of removing unused code? Um, and uh, essentially, we want to create a feedback loop uh, that also um, can direct us. Um, so we want engineers to also tell us about how things went with executing these refactorings. And maybe with their experience in the code base, they will be able to point us to you know, further refactorings that we haven't even thought about. They are the domain experts at the end of the day. And with this, we, we use this feedback to continue to continually improve in the model, the data mov model of the code base. So we, I touched briefly on getting management buy-in. Um, we think it's, uh, it's an important concept that deserved a, um, uh, a little bit more of a little bit um, uh, a slide on its own. Uh, so refactoring is really a noble quest. We all know it. We, we would like to really make things better for ourselves and for the systems that we work with. Um, who might not know about it is um, our management, right? So we really want to be able to justify this effort. And uh, if we don't have a precise and measurable way to measure, to, to to, to go to management uh, or to whoever is the stakeholder and um, claim that certain benefits can be achieved by refactoring, um, then we, we will never get buy-in. Um, so these are a few benefits um, that I've already mentioned, but basically they are about improving developer efficiency, the testing and the quality of the system, um, of course, uh, as a consequence, we reduce the downtime, we reduce the number of bugs, and everything else basically um, um, gets better. So as a conclusion, um, just to wrap up our conversation, um, we started with defining what success is, and we, we saw that success is often messy. Um, there is a, and, and that's fine, because otherwise there wouldn't be success, right? Uh, we would have missed time to market, for example. Um, we often cannot observe, obsess over perfection. We don't have the luxury to do that. Um, but we still need an ability to adapt to change. Um, as Paco mentioned, this is a theme that has uh, be, been mentioned throughout the past two days. Um, and we believe that refactoring, continuous refactoring, is essential to uh, ensure that uh, we uh, can adapt to this change. And the technical debt, basically, we, we, we keep the technical debt under control. Um, but we also saw that even executing refactorings that are seemingly simple um, is a difficult operation at scale. And so our approach, we believe that a good approach when you have a massive code base is to apply, apply data-driven refactorings, um, which is justified in that case. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. Great. Any questions from anyone? Five minutes to go. At the front.
what languages do you think that um, your approach has um, applicability to? Yeah, so as I, as I mentioned, we, we, we work primarily in Java, and uh, I believe that having a, t a strongly typed language would definitely be an advantage because you, know, you can define things more precisely um, in code, so at compile time or at static time. Um, dynamic languages might present additional challenges. We haven't really explored them, so I can't really you know, have a precise answer to that question. I believe it's, it's many ideas are still applicable to uh, dynamic, dynamically typed languages. And besides the, the general, the more general ideas on how to approach refactoring um, is still very much applicable regardless of the language or the platform that, uh, that you have. Cool. Have you used any runtime data? Or is it all static analysis based? Uh, no, we can. Yeah, so, so, so we, we do plug in runtime data, so that's the ultimate goal. Um, but, but we are dealing with uh, you know, um, hun hundreds of, of thousands of instances. So, so collecting that data and plugging it into, into our model is, is significant effort. So, so it, is, it is that final check. Um, and, and these are things you can do in Java, for example, looking at what types are, are loaded at runtime by your JVM. So taking things like JVM dumps would be a, a good strategy there. Um, so, so that is something we have explored. Uh, you have touched on sort of convincing, uh, let's call them product, uh, to take on a refactoring load in, in, in the engineering's uh, workload. Um, but apart from things like container size and build times, are there ways that you can measure the impact on developer efficiency better uh, that you know of, that you've observed? Or did you say as, as much as you, you can? I don't know. Um, so, so we we in in still fairly early early phases of of, of this effort. But um, for for example, if if we can measure something like if I can delete a type, uh, the the act of deleting that type has has a value, and and these are things we've we've explored in our model. So as an example, if I delete a type, I can remove the dependency. If I remove that dependency, um, the compilation of of that unit or, or you know, building that service will be quicker, uh, it will load faster, so a developer can test it quicker. So, so we, can, um, we can predict these things, but the next step would obviously be to, to actually go and make the change and then feed back. So, so what is nice about our model is we can go back a year um, and regenerate the same model and com compare the, the, two, um, the two states. So by doing that, we can obviously have a a longer term um, answer to that question. But, but for now, we, we're, not, uh, we're not answering that yet. Cool, thank you very much. That was a very cool um, approach that you have. Um, I'd like to know, how do you scope your refactorings in terms of how long do you want to, how do, how long do you end up spending on them? And um, have there ever been um, cases where you had to back out of a refactory because it's taking too much time, or yeah. Um, yeah. In, in, in our example, we uh, yeah we we we're still just building building models, collecting data, and and we we, we have uh, started the process of automation. Um, but but the idea is that it shouldn't take long. So, the, for example, if if we look at the de delete refactoring, that should be something you can do instantly. Um, so there shouldn't be a time impact. Uh, because we've, you know, the whole purpose of building this model is to make it safe and efficient. Um, so if the refactorings take too long, then we need to go back to the drawing board because that's just not, in, in our case, isn't, isn't feasible. But, but maybe in smaller code bases, you know, you, you would have to figure out what the value of that refactoring is. So I think it's more a mindset shift that I want to do this refactoring because I know if I make this change, the system will start up quicker and I can deploy this thing faster. You, know, you, you need to come up with a, 
a strategy that you need to present and maybe pick an easy case, do it, demonstrate and say, I did this, I got a 50% increase, so I now need budget to go do the bigger one. So it's, it's, it's really on a case-by-case -case basis, You've, but, but the mindset is still the same. Don't refactor until you know it's of value. Um, and, and a reason why delete refactoring is a good point to start is I want to delete things. So if I'm going to be doing a massive library upgrade, um, why should engineers be upgrading libraries all over the place and changing code and fixing tests if that code is never invoked and never run? Um, so it's sensible to just take the easy, low-hanging fruit first and uh, don't refactor just for the sake of it because it's, you, you've got to move the needle um, to justify doing it. I'm going to add to Quickly that. Add, adding to that, um, that we also experimented with um, uh, scoring refactorings or you know measuring not not all classes might be equals you know there might be some classes that are more crucial um, uh, and that are more important to to delete for whatever reason um, so we also experimented with assigning different values to to different refactorings cool excellent Thank you. We'll wrap there, and uh, these guys will be around for more questions during the break. Cool.